Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, God's gift to man, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of joy, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus this morning. That joy is exuding from your soul in the fact that you are a member of the living God. And at the end of the day, Jesus wins, hallelujah, and you have been chosen to be on his side. Oh, what a promise, friends. What joy should flow from our hearts as together we say, as quoted to us in Revelation chapter 19, hallelujah, salvation, glory, honor, and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. Hallelujah, friends. Now we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and we are very early on here. We are even before the flood. And in understanding the flood in the next few verses we talk about, it's important that we tie in the first few verses of chapter 6 where we are told in the Hebrew that Nephilim were born as a result of the sons of God, or as we would call them, the fallen angels have sexual intercourse with the women of earth, and these giants, a race unto themselves, are causing much chaos upon planet earth. The Bible even calls it violence. And that's where we're going to pick up today in verse 9 of chapter 6. Now it says, these are the generations of Noah, and Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, as I told you on the last video, there are those who assume, and I use assume for a very specific reason because it is speculation, but it does make a lot of sense if you lean to the understanding that the sons of God are the fallen angels. Because the next thought that that would take us into is why did Lucifer direct these fallen angels to have sexual intercourse with these women? And we would be left only to conclude that it would be to corrupt the bloodline. You see, if the bloodline is corrupt, then the promised one can never come. And so it is a genius strategy and one that should be at least considered. And so when we read in verse 9 that Noah was a just man, he was right before God, and he was perfect in his generation, there are those that would tell us that when it says he's perfect in his generation, his bloodline was perfect. It had not been contaminated or corrupted. And so God must carry it over into the new world so that the promised one, Messiah, would come. It says in verse 10, Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And again, this violence could be the creation or the cause of the giants. Because these giants were so large, the food they consumed was three to four times greater than that of man. And maybe even they turned on men and consumed the men of earth. Maybe they were warring against themselves and men were caught in the middle. Whatever the case, we know that the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And so God looked upon the earth and seeing that it was corrupt and that all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth, God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. Now this is a mere 2,000 years after God first created Adam. And God says the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So I want you to make an ark of gopher wood, Noah. I want you to make rooms in the ark. I want you to pitch it within and without with pitch or with tar to seal it to make it float worthy and flood proof. And then God tells Noah specifically how to build it. He says, I want the length of the ark to be 300 cubits or 150 yards, which is a football field and a half. 
I want the breadth of it to be 50 cubits, which would be 25 yards. And so it's 150 yards long by 25 yards wide. And the height of it I want to be 30 cubits, or 15 yards high. I want you to place a window in the ark. I want you to put a door in the ark. And I want the ark to be three stories high. And behold, I, the Almighty, even I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth, and it will destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now this presents an interesting question that must be addressed. Remember, in chapter 6, verse 4, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. In the Hebrew, that would be the word Nephilim. And also after that. Now, if everything on the earth is going to be destroyed, I present an obvious question. How did the giants survive after that? How did the bloodline of the giants survive after that? The only conclusion that I can find would be that one of the three or all three of the three wives of Noah's sons had to have the corrupt seed, the corrupt bloodline in their veins because Noah was pure and most likely his wife and sons were pure. So if the seed of the giant was to be carried into the new world, it could only have come if all flesh would be destroyed during the flood, it could only come by one of the three wives of the children. If you have a different observation, please share that in the description box for I would love to hear it and share it with others. And so God says, I will bring a flood upon the earth and through these waters all flesh on the earth and all things that fly in the heavens shall die. But with thee, Noah, I will establish my covenant. I will establish a promise and you will come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort or two of every kind, thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee. And it shall be food for thee and for them, for the animals. Thus did Noah, being obedient to the command of the Lord, so did he. Now there are those that would tell us two of every kind, there's no possible way that the flood could hold that amount of animals. But remember, it's 150 yards long, 25 yards wide, 15 yards high, with three stories, enough to contain two of every kind, kind being the key word, meaning that it doesn't have to be two of every breed because there are a lot of different kinds of felines in the cat family. But God simply says, bring two of every cat into the ark. Two of every kind, not two of every breed. Now, there are those that are much more educated than I am that have mathematically broken this down. And what they tell us is that the room on the ark would be the same as 800 railroad cars in volume. 800 railroad cars. Do you think they could hold two of every kind? It certainly starts to make more sense. But we know as we continue the story that it wasn't just two of every kind that were contained within the ark. For in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. But notice verse 2, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, seven of every kind of clean beast, without spot, without blemish, the male and his female and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Now remember, as far as we know, and I emphasize those words, as far as we know, rain had not fallen upon the earth. 
Water had never fell out of the sky. And so when Noah is proclaiming to all those who live around him that he's building this boat because water's going to fall out of the sky, he must have appeared as a madman. Yet his obedience unto his God was his priority. And so God says, in seven days, I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And every living substance that I have made, that I have created, says God, will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Now, friends, as you know, the purpose of these lessons together each morning isn't necessarily that we learn or even understand the word of God. While that is true, we want to find application to the word of God. And so what we can take from this lesson this morning that will help us in our journeys is the idea of obedience. Obedience, even when the command of God seems absurd. Now, of course, when we feel like the Lord is speaking to us, guiding us, leading us to do something that maybe we don't understand, we must always weigh it to the word of God. For instance, God is never going to tell us to bomb an abortion clinic because that goes against the very principles of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thou shalt not kill and other such commandments. But there are times when God might tell us to do something that absolutely makes no sense to us. But if we are truly listening to his voice, we're going to be obedient no matter the cost unto us. I can even recall the story where Jesus told the man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam seven times. If he never had have went, he never would have been healed. If he would have only washed six times, he would have never been healed. If he would have washed eight or more times, he would have never been healed. The command of the Lord was very precise and had to be obeyed to the last detail in order for him to receive his healing. Or what about when God told the people of Israel to march around the city of Jericho with very precise instructions? And if they had broken one of those instructions we would not have seen the walls of Jericho fall. And so as you listen to the voice of God, be very careful that you do not disregard what he is leading you to do simply because it does not make sense or the cost to you is going to be too great, too high a price to be paid. And we know that the rejection that Noah suffered from those around him, the way that he was mocked, ridiculed, and chastised, how he was ostracized from the people around him, and even his family's character being attacked. The cost to Noah was great. Yet despite all the negative consequences that came from Noah's obedient, Noah remained obedient. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and I truly pray that you will learn obedience unto the Lord. For as Jesus said, when you are faithful in the small things, In the minor details, the Almighty will entrust to you even greater things. So seek today the minor details of what the Bible teaches us as his followers, specifically things you might read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or even in the writings, the letters of Paul unto the early churches. For it's in the minor details, friends, that great things can come. Now, may your journey be blessed today with the Lord Jesus. May you be full of his spirit and walk with joy and praise in your hearts and upon your lips. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you and want to encourage you to keep your mind upon the things of God, not on the things of this earth. Now, as he wills and until next time, I'll see you on the next video. 